Well, it's great to be here. Uh, it's, I, I think I've sailed it in Nantucket about six times in the IODs over the ma many years that, you, it's now been quite a few years, Peter, hasn't it, that you've had a fleet here, and it's been a great reason to come back and reconnect with friends here. Tonight, I'm going to take you on a journey, uh, uh, how the IOD began, how it began to be sailed more internationally, uh, the transition that it had to make to modern materials, the spectacular venues we have. We're going to show you a little bit of boat building uh, and give you a sense of what the class has become today. Um, but first, I want to check uh, who's here in the audience. Who has who sailed with me in a boat before? Roy, Rachel, Melissa, and Nat. Okay. And who sailed against me in an IOD? Uh, I'm sure there's more than that. <laughs> um, who's been out in the local IOD fleet? Who's done some sailing? Great. Great. Uh, and who just loves pictures of sailboats? Because we've got a lot of that tonight, too. <laughs> okay. Um, so, my wife Rachel's here. She's uh, she is a teacher prof teaches at Brown, but on the water we call her the professor of puffology because she calls the breeze better than anybody I know. And uh, we've had it wasn't too hard to tell which way the wind was coming from today when we were biking back from Sconset on Pulpus Road directly into the southwest breeze. It was, we've been recovering all afternoon since then, but it's really been fun to be out here uh, on the, on the uh, island with you guys. So in the spring of 1936, a New York stockbroker saw a beautiful boat in Bermuda, and he made a decision. And 50 years later, that decision changed the course of my life, our lives, and it's something that, uh, it's, a de it's a decision that has changed the course of hundreds of sailors over the years. And this is the boat. It's a six-meter design called Saga. Uh, Cornelius Shields spotted her racing in Bermuda. She was owned by a Bermudan and decided to create a class to sail on Long Island Sound to replace the then aging Sound Inner Club class. Uh, the boats were falling apart. This is the inside of Saga, 37 foot. It's a little bit bigger than an IOD, uh, built with full-length planks, uh, glued on the edges, fastened to cedar frames. And here's the designer and builder, Bjarni Os. He uh, owned a shipyard in Friedrichstad, Norway, which is on the Oslo Fjord on the east side about an hour, hour and a half south. Uh, he had, about the same time that he designed Saga, designed three identical six meters. And so he'd gotten the idea of doing mass production. And he developed this plan for this slightly smaller boat that became the International One design. He heard somehow that Corny Shields was interested in a new class, sent the plans, but there was no interest, no response, until Shields saw Saga in, and saw how beautifully built it was. So this is, this is Shields. This is not in the 30s. This is in 1953. Not, maybe there's some other sailors who were on Time Magazine's cover after that, but Ted Turner, perhaps, or Dennis Conner, maybe. But... Um, this is, this is, it's like a 12-page story in the magazine. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, so he saw Saga, Shields did, formed a syndicate of three other, with three other men, and they put a plan together to uh, uh, buy 25 of these things. And I think they just, they put on a big dinner, invited all the Sound Inner Club owners that they wanted in the fleet, and uh, maybe some others, and they... Uh, they had a price that was pretty amazing. First, they put a floor on what you could sell your Sound Inner Club for, for $2,100. And they, were get, they got a deal from Os in Norway 
to build, ship, equip, ship, and deliver two dozen boats from Norway for $2,670 each. That's a $570 net. And I think they sold them all in about one or two evenings. This is what the lines look like. As I said, it's slightly smaller than Saga. Uh, it's 33 feet, five and a half inches long, 21 feet six on the water line, uh, 7,100 pounds, much of that lead. And I'll, I think I have a picture of the lead keel that I'll show you in a minute. But these views show the boat from the side, from the front, the back, the top, and the bottom. And if you want to take a closer look, they're all on the IOD website. And these are the construction drawings, which uh, show you how OS put the boats together. And I'm not going to go into detail here, but just take, take note of where the rudder hangs off the back of the keel, and then the lead keel is what's hanging off the piece of wood that goes all the way up to the bow. Because here is being mass produced in the shipyard, all of these, um, basically the, the foundation of these boats. Um, in addition to the order from Long Island Sound, as soon as the word got out, Bermuda decided to buy boats, Northeast Harbor, Marblehead, uh, and later Cowes, Marseille, and uh, also in Norway. And this is what the production lo line looks like in 1936 uh, on a little island called Isegrin, which is part of Friedrichstad. Uh, and the keel's being bolted in place here. And in a matter of a few months, they built, well, they built the first four boats, but then the rest of the boats they built pretty rapidly afterwards. And, you know, no knowing how long it takes to repair and rebuild one wooden IOD. I mean, it's kind of miraculous. I, and it's proof, obviously, that they knew what they were doing better back then, and also that it's easier to start from scratch than to <laughs> rebuild a wooden boat sometimes. But here the boats get put onto a barge uh, and sent down to the port. They get lifted onto the a freighter and by, uh, as James said, by December of 1936, four were delivered, and uh, Shields went sailing at Christmas. He ordered the boats in April. Wow. The next season, all these boats are, 25 of them are on the line. This photography, uh, which some of you may recognize, is courtesy of the Mystic Seaport Museum, which owns the Rosenfeld Collection. Rosenfeld was a preeminent photographer uh, marine photographer from about the turn of the last century to the 60s. So here, not, this is the first or second season. Number eight takes the windward position uh, at the starting line. And this boat was called Ginch, sailed by Eddie and Cooch Maxwell. Uh, their father, Henry, was one of the four who underwrote with shields the sort of put the money up to get the get the fleet started uh, before everyone bought in. His, so his son, his two sons just out of college are given the boats to sa boat to sail. And his grandson, Wes Maxwell, was born in the 40s after they were out of the class, but he now lives in Stonington and owns a fiberglass IOD that sails at Fisher's Island. And uh, same name, it's called Ginch. Uh, what, what I found, in, and the more I researched in this class, and I'm sure I've just scratched the surface, is how family traditions have carried on, uh, carried this class as long as it has. So Eddie, who was one of the college, college grads who was sailing in 1937, is still supporting the f local fleet uh, at Fishers Island. It's the, the race committee boat for the Mystic River Mudheads, which is right across in Connecticut. Uh, is named after him, and it was the race committee boat for the 2013 Worlds that we hosted at Fisher's Island, which is where I sail. Um, okay, we're going to shift gears a little bit, just talk about photographers like the Rosenfelds, who've been taking photos of these boats for 80 years, and I've looked at a lot of these photos. Um, there are a lot 
in this book, um, which I didn't, I wrote, I think I wrote the Fisher's Island chapter, but um, it's, uh, you get a chance to take a look at it later if you like, but there are a lot of great photos in there, and we have, well, the boat's been around for 80 years. A lot of photos are out there. And the next two photos I'm going to show you are Rosenfelds, and I think they are about the two most spectacular IOD photos ever taken. This is 1941, and I really don't, I don't know if anybody has done it better since. Uh, it's blowing 25 to 30, maybe more, and uh, these are cotton sails. Uh, proof that IODs can sail in pretty heavy air without reefing. You just ease the main and twist it off. The guy closest to us probably should have eased his main a little bit more. Uh, he's, uh, he, he's fallen behind the other two. This is probably the same day. Uh, <clears throat> and that guy on the foredeck, right there, he looks, looks a little like he's ready to abandon ship. I think there's, we should have a caption competition to decide what he's saying. OK, so the, that was the beginning of the class. The class uh, is another Rosenfeld. Um, began to be, uh, it wasn't originally an international, very international class, even though it was in the name. Uh, Shield's motivation was to compete against the best. And in the post-war, the class was really the hotbed for America's Cup skipper development. Bus Mossbacker, Briggs Cunningham, Shields, Bill Cox, Arthur Knapp. Uh, and uh, up in Marblehead, where they had a fleet, a young sailmaker, Ted Hood, who became an America's Cup skipper, was cutting his teeth uh, in the class. But the inner fleet classing didn't get, class racing didn't get going for a little while, except in Bermuda. And, you know, back at the beginning when Saga, Saga was in, we showed you Saga, which was in Bermuda, the boats, um, they were shipping six meters back and forth from New York to uh, Bermuda. Uh, then they got the IODs and that leveled the playing field. At first they shipped them back and forth and then they realized, oh, we'll just sail each other's boats. And that was really the beginning of what the class does now so well, which is to just Invite people, loan the boats, and um, uh, go sail in some spectacular places in addition to your own, uh, your own waters. But the Long Island Sound versus Bermuda competition went on for years. This is the Amarita Cup that the Bermudans uh, won in the early 60s, but it went back and forth for 50 years. There's a photo from 59 taken in Bermuda out of their club archives. And it happened to be a day that the Duke of Edinburgh was on board with Bert Darrell in the back there, who is the uh, probably Bermuda's best sailor ever, uh, and also apparently had the most colorful language of any sailor uh, <clears throat> in Bermuda. They tried to get him to tone it down for the Duke, but he didn't. <laughs> and the Duke loved it, of course. This is the King Edward Gold Cup, and I'm going to just talk about trophies for a few minutes. This trophy, like the Amarita Cup, was um, contested for a long time uh, between Bermuda and Long Island Sound, and then became a uh, uh, professional match race uh, competition in Bermuda uh, in the mid-'80s, uh, and it still is today, uh, but really a spectacular trophy. This is the array of trophies they lay out at the World Championship now. Bjarne Ios gave the tall one on the left, uh, and then second place, third place. The crew trophy, the first yacht club trophy. But the best story I have about trophies is this one, which I had never heard of before uh, a couple months ago. Pat McMichael really wanted this trophy. And she was an avid Larchmont Yacht Club sailor. <coughs> Excuse me. What this says, <laughs> it's a whole lot of, hand, of engraving, isn't it? Uh, is that if you win this three times, you get to keep the trophy. 
So her husband, Howard McMichael, is, well, they're waiting for wind on Long Island Sound. Something new there. Uh, sorry, Tom. <clears throat> uh, but they're aboard, Pat is behind Howard. They're aboard number 12, Kangaroo, uh, they, and they won Larchmont Race Week that, that first year. Yeah, this is uh, 1962. After winning that year, Howard got busy with business, chartered his boat called Kangaroo to somebody else. And, but when Larchmont Race Week came around, Pat made him go charter somebody else's boat so they could go after the bowl again. And they won it. And the third year, they got Kangaroo back, and they won it again. So uh, this story came from their son, Howie McMichael, who's uh, some of you may know. He's a boat broker in um, Mamaroneck. Good photographer. Took some nice pictures of uh, I have a couple of his photos in here. Um, but the best thing he did for me was he shined the silver so that we could, <laughs> we could show the pictures. But times were changing in the 60s. Nylon spinnakers projected better. Dacron sails had already made their arrival. Other boats had fiberglass hulls. Masts were made of aluminum instead of wood. And there was competition uh, on the horizon. And boom, the Etchells 22 came out uh, in the mid-60s. And Sleek, fast, lots of modern controls, fiberglass, much lower maintenance. Uh, and so McMichael and several others moved to the Etchells. And in a few short years, the IOD was no longer the premier class on Long Island Sound. The class didn't give up. They began building fiberglass boats in Norway. And it was important enough, even the New York Times covered it. <clears throat> or it was a slow news day. The uh, Ose shipyard was out of business, but Bjarn, and Bjarni Ose died about that time. But his son, Henrik, built the first fiberglass boats. Uh, Ted Hood began developing the masts, and this was the first glass boat that arrived, which I just like it because the guy's hat. That's what all, all boatyard guys wear in, that, in those days, perhaps. One of the key players in the class at that time was the second president, the president after Corny Shields, named Bill John. That's him on the dock uh, with the first glass boat and helped lead the class for many, many years through the transition. And Thornton Clark uh, of Marblehead was the third president uh, and was, pro it was the first time the class had a newsletter, at least that we've discovered. Uh, he traveled to Europe. I uh, went to Norway and bought the molds for the class so that it preserved its, was able to reproduce <laughs> uh, uh, as needed over the years, and boats were subsequently built in the U.S. The class needed to do something different, do, and uh, Thornton encouraged uh, the fleet that was in Scotland, which was a reformed group of boats from uh, cows, apparently, to host the world championship up there. And that really, the fleet didn't last forever in Scotland. To, it lasted till about 15 years ago. But um, it's, uh, it, was, it really did get, you know, traveling to Scotland or uh, gave the people in the class a sense of this really is an international class. Geordie Walker, uh, was a sailor in Bermuda. The fleet there was falling into disrepair because the wood boats in that climate just did not hold up. He refused to let the IOD go and organized a company to build new glass boats in Bermuda, and they got a second set of molds off of the molds that came back from Norway and took them to Bermuda. Actually, that set of molds has subsequently gone to Scotland and to Sweden. Uh, so it's, Jordy was a key player in keeping the class going. I think he owned about five IODs for a while. Uh, but Bermuda's fleet became kind of a, an anchor for the class, I think. Uh, 
race week and other regattas that they held there were pretty attractive, not only to people from the U.S., but people from Europe. And it, it brought people together. Um, long before the America's Cup was held on the Great Sound, we were sailing IODs there. And uh, we're still sailing IODs there. It's a beautiful sort of two-mile circle in a lake that's set in the middle of the ocean. Sometimes it's pretty windy, but it's, the water's always warm. On Long Island Sound, um, meanwhile, Jim Bishop uh, Sr. promoted the fleet. He was uh, probably not the only person, but he was pivotal. He also bought several fiberglass boats. I remember about Jim when we were getting into the classes, how he talked about the boat being like a Stradivarius. You know, you, it was the work of a lifetime to learn how to play it to get the most out of the instrument. Uh, Jim arranged the purchase, as I mentioned, of several uh, IODs and uh, chartered them out to younger sailors. Uh, this is his beautiful Coastal Queen, which I think. It uh, was probably the power boat that showed up at the most IOD regattas over the years. <coughs> uh, Jim Sr. passed on earlier this year. This is a photo of Jim Jr. Uh, on the left um, with uh, some of his friends, including Elliot Whistler, who's won the world a couple times with his daughter there, Mackenzie. My story with the class gets going it was before, before that time, but somewhere in here. Uh, we, we bought our, there were four boats at Fisher's Island in the mid 80, late 80s, and we bought, uh, uh, we bought into one when it, was, it needed to change hands uh, with about four friends. Uh, and the joke is that we bought it for $10,000, and every year we buy it again. Uh, I'm not sure we've actually held it to 10,000, but uh, it's, uh, it's really been just a, a, a great boat to have in our family. Uh, anyway, you'll have to forgive a little, there's a little bit of a scrapbook tour of the Burnham, Burnham photos uh, in the rest of the presentation. Uh, these are two of our early boats. My cousin Brad owns the one with the wooden mast there, and I, I included it because this was 88, 89, 90, somewhere in there, and it's an example of how the boats were, could compete with wood mass and fiberglass, uh, uh, aluminum mass, but uh, it was, Brad always thought we had an advantage, so eventually, I think he broke his mast, and I think it was time to, to go to aluminum. But our syndicate was the brainchild of Lori Rubineau, uh, and uh, Beth Sholley, Peter Rugg, and I still own, are still three of the, three of the original five partners. In this picture, uh, Jennifer Miller from Fisher's Island. Let's see if I've got that. Well, she's peeking out from behind the jib. Uh, she, what? No, it's a different Jennifer Miller. Uh, we have two in the class. She's now Jennifer Miller Mancusi Ungaro. She's mar she married into the Marblehead fleet. Uh, Jennifer Miller is a second generation, or maybe third, from, third generation sailor from Larchmont. But Lori in the front here was our syndicate chair for years and years. Uh, and uh, this is just a photo from the Round Island race. My daughter Olivia and me and uh, Peter Rugg, our partner. Jennifer's example, Jennifer Miller Mancusi and Garo, uh, is a, a great example of part of the inter, um, the increasing interconnection of the, all the various fleets. The class is, has really become the sum of not only its great venues, but there's kind of a networked um, IOD sailing community that's reinforced by the World Championship, the North Americans, Bermuda Race Week, the Nantucket Invitational, uh, the Nantucket, uh, the Celebrity Regatta that you have, and uh, a couple of other events. And 
a lot people really get to know each other. There's this this broader community. So you have your own local fleet, and then you have this much broader family that you get to know over the years. Um, and this is a photo from Marblehead where they actually sail out in the ocean, and we learn to sail in different kind of waves. Uh, but when we go to a regatta like this, we arrive with duct tape, a Leatherman or Gerber, and um, a check for the insurance, <laughs> and uh, maybe some foul weather gear. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's a special event. Uh, Marblehead, as a class, was dominant through the 70s and the 80s. Um, most prolific was Bill Widnall, who some of you may have met. Uh, he has he is won the class championship more than anyone else 10 times uh, between 1964 and 2013. And he's still showing up. Uh, he's, he's a remarkable sailor. This is an example of the kind of venue that we get to go to. You know your own venue here, but this is the Eastern Yacht Club in Marblehead. Uh, just spectacular. Our first world championship was in 1988 in Northeast Harbor in Maine. This is a truly unforgettable venue. Uh, Cadillac Mountain in the background uh, on Mount Desert is just looming overhead the whole time. And this is a, a print from a uh, from a slide by Story Litchfield, author of A uh, Great Sailor from up there in the 80s, Wayne Wibby. Uh, if you've ever, who's sailed in the Mount Desert area uh, before? A few people, yeah, several people. The wind is really crazy. <laughs> it, it just, it shifts all the time. And um, it's a, it, they're, they have the biggest fleet in Northeast Harbor of uh, more than 20 boats. And they usually put them all out on the starting line. And it's, uh, it's just uh, fantastic. This is mm, 30 years, almost 30 years later, Northeast Harbor last year. They still sail with the wooden masts up there. So in their fleet, they've, they have wooden masts, wooden booms. Um, and the boats are, are just it's beautiful to sort of see what they were like when they were, or get a taste of what they were like when they were new. Of course, the equipment has been upgraded. There's a lot of Harkin blocks and so on and so forth. Some fleets have the same color spinnakers for all the boats. Nantucket's an example. They have the most diverse spinnaker colors in Northeast Harbor, and I think it's to match the changeable winds. This is, a, this is a, a photo of the Northeast Harbor Fleet, which is their yacht club. It's a small, sort of a two-room two clubhouse on a spectacular site on the, on the, on the harbor there. Um, this is a snapshot from 1994. It was our, the second time we went to the Worlds there. And I put it in just to, as a reminder that life happens when you're sailing. You're going to IOD regattas every year. Uh, Isabel was my young, oldest daughter. Was born in uh, the year just before the first year we went there. We had three daughters by the time we went back, um, and we remember. We we'll always remember the thrill of winning this regatta, um, but even more so, we remember that was the year that. Two weeks later, Sophie went to Children's Hospital and had heart, heart surgery that was successful, and she's doing great. But it's, it's all interwoven, and it's one of the most fun things. In 1990, we went to Scotland. Uh, this is on the Clyde, which is west of Glasgow. And uh, I, I was a magazine editor for a number of years, and I assign myself to cover this regatta. Uh, <clears throat> this is a proof from the magazine that's hung on my wall ever since. Uh, a photographer named Roger Leanne Verco. And uh, this is a really memorable venue. It's very tidal. Uh, the winds are usually pretty good. And there's no hills that are greener <laughs> 
when the sun finally comes out. It did happen a couple times, and I think Roger got the shot. Uh, so this is the story a few months later. I think my headline was partly right. The, um, the uh, Scotland fleet failed about 10 years later, but it's the only fleet that's failed in the whole time, time we've been in the class. And uh, a small subset of it is reconvened in the south of England at St. Maw's. And I'll show you some examples of new fleets that have grown. The House of Windsor uh, showed up for this regatta too. This is 1990 in Scotland. Uh, Princess Anne arrived to christen a new boat because the molds had, arrived, had gotten there at that point. And she was there to congratulate us for our third place. We went to San Francisco the next year. How many people have sailed in San Francisco? It's, uh, it's a windy, cold venue, but every view is spectacular. And you know this even if you've just driven around the bay. Uh, but I just, I just, I could have had all San Francisco photos in this, in this talk. Um, this is where we learn to race IODs in 20 knots plus and be comfortable with them, because the boats can take it, but sometimes the sailors can't. Uh, but my favorite story from our time in sailing in San Francisco is uh, that the first time we went there, Beth Sholley, who was one of my boat partners, and I got a couple friends together, Frank and Kathy, and the next time we went, we stayed with Frank and Kathy and their two little kids. So more life happening be due to the IOD class. This is San Francisco Yacht Club, which is, uh, there's a long story to this, but it's actually over in, on the Tiburon side. Uh, St. Francis Yacht Club is the other half of the Yacht Club <laughs> that's on the San Francisco side. But when you sail back in here at the end of the day, the temperature goes up 20 degrees. And it's like you've died and gone to heaven, I think, because uh, it's cold out there. So no history of the IOD class would be complete without uh, mentioning Jan Petter Road, who, like Jim Bishop, like, well, so many fleets have their people, their, their leaders who have been so committed to them. Jan Petter is an excellent sailor, especially in heavy air, and he's known for long speeches at dinner after IOD regattas, or during IOD regattas, sometimes off color, no, always off color. Uh, and he, but he has spent a lot of time nurturing the, the fleet there. Uh, he, this is, they race, uh, well the fleet is recently, is recently now in two places, um, but the, the, for the longest time they've been in Tunsburg, which is a, an hour south of Oslo on the western side of the Oslo Fjord. And it's, it looks a little bit like you're racing in Maine, but, um, but the water's warmer, and um, the winds are fairly light, uh, light to moderate for the most part. They have two, two areas that they race in. One is uh, you can race in really close to shore, and usually the wind's a little better, or you go outside these ledges and uh, race on the outside, and usually not quite as much wind. But we went in 1995 with the three daughters. Uh, our first worlds there, and the first worlds that they had had in Norway in decades. And um, here's three little girls and Rachel getting to making friends uh, with Sarah from Norway and Janice from Bermuda. And again, friends we've had ever since. So this was my second assignment, of course, uh, in the IOD class. Uh, and, I, and it's when I visited the factory uh, in uh, Friedrichstad, and you recognize one of those photos there. But it was about sort of the, the resurrection of the, of the class in Norway itself. Uh, the first worlds at Fishers Island in 96, and don't worry, I'm not going to show you every world championship uh, between then and now. Uh, we had a, we, our fleet had grown to 10 boats, 
and uh, we bolstered our ranks by borrowing some boats from Marblehead. And that's also something that happens commonly. Nantucket boats have been loaned to Fisher's Island for regattas, and uh, we've sent boats to Marblehead and so on. This is uh, just a few years ago, uh, another championship at Fisher's Island, a little brighter, sunnier day. And this is our small clubhouse there where we host the regatta. Probably the best photo taken of an IOD at Fisher's Island is this photo of uh, Gesture, which is owned by Charlie Van Voorhis, who's the class president and multiple time champion. This photo is taken from Groton Long Point in Connecticut with, I can't imagine how long a lens, uh, but that's Fisher's Island in the background, two, two miles away. Uh, and it was blowing about at least 30 knots and then got windier. But I'm gonna show you some real windy shots and we're gonna go back to Bermuda to take a look at that. I mentioned the, uh, the what's now called the Argo, Hmm, Argo Gold Cup, I think, but that tro a gold trophy I showed you uh, is raced for by professionals now. And they'll race in any wind that the race committee sends them out in, and they do it right in Hamilton Harbor. And sometimes the boats start to rock and roll a little bit. Uh, now, I raced one time in this in the 90s, and... Uh, qualified to go far enough to be beaten by Russell Coots. But I'm glad to see that sometimes the pros get humbled too. Because this, in this sequence, uh, I don't know if you can tell, but the guy on the deck looks like he's dragging himself back on the boat. Top of the spinnaker doesn't look in real good shape, and here it came down on both sides of the boat. Might have gone to the sailmaker after that, or, or the dumpster. And this is Dean Barker, who is an America's Cup skipper from New Zealand, uh, demonstrating the jibe brooch, which is, which is a very difficult maneuver in the IOD because the boat has this long keel and it's actually quite stable. You can rock and roll quite a bit and the boat doesn't wipe out like a more modern boat. But just watch. <laughs> so the boom comes across and then he skews back the other way, and now the boom goes the other way. Um, Dean didn't win that race, I don't think. Uh, but remarkably, the, uh, although it looks like there's probably water coming in the cockpit, there's very little water coming in the cockpit. The, the, the boats are remarkably seaworthy compared to some other boats that we have all sailed. Uh, so, now, are you ready for something different? This is a little test. What's out of place or missing in the picture? I'm going to show you a few pictures. Uh, the class is long inspired artists. And this is almost a perfect IOD, but there's, there's one thing wrong with it. This is my daughter drew this. Any, anyone got a suggestion? I think I actually heard somebody say masthead. That's the only error. Uh, there are some other minor typos and so on, but yeah, the head stay should go to the, shouldn't go all the way to the masthead. Uh, how about what's missing in this photo? He doesn't have a cold one in the other hand. <laughs> okay, how about this? What's wrong with this picture? No, the, whale, the whale's in the right building, don't you think? That's not an IOD, it's a shield. Um, out in Monterey, we don't have an IOD fleet there, but we, there is a shields fleet. Uh, Rachel and I were sailing on, in a shields in that regatta. I just figured, it's a whaling museum. So, a few more great venues, and we're gonna show Nantucket in a few minutes. This photo's from the 2009 Worlds in Sweden. Strong breeze, sometimes the, breeze, the weather can be anything in Sweden. Uh, it's probably a little too hot right now from what I've been reading. But uh, 
the last time we went over there, it was really windy, and they're having the world's the world championship there this year as well. Are you, anyone going from here? Richard, okay. Uh, but it's just a it's the Swedes are they they mm, along with the Norwegians. No, I think they do throw the best parties. I'm going to get in trouble because this is record being recorded. <laughs> but they do they put on a great show and the yacht club in Stenningsund is probably the most photogenic sailing club that uh, that we sail at. I mean, there are obviously some other nice ones, um, but they do they do give you one challenge, which is how to sail your boat into the slip. That's something that. We don't test ourselves uh, with 7,000 pounds. If you haven't sailed an IOD, you can start luffing and you'll go right through that glass case over there very easily, straight into the wind, um, or maybe twice as far. So you really have to figure out how to put on the brakes. Does anybody recognize this venue? I really think you all here in Nantucket have one of the best sailing venues uh, that, we, that we have in the IOD class. Uh, it's, the water's not warm, but it feels pretty good right about now, I'd say. Uh, but you have some of the best breezes, and you have two great regattas every year that you invite others to come sail in. Uh, the celebrity regatta, raising money for the community sailing, and the invitational regatta at the beginning of the year um, both of which I've sailed in, and um, the competition's always great, and the weather conditions are, I mean, sometimes the wind doesn't blow, but usually you've got a great breeze. Um, your sea breeze is better than pretty much any sea breeze west of here. Uh, and uh, the new fleet that uh, Peter and Whitey Willauer and Bruce Failing started in the 90s is, uh, it's not the newest fleet, but I think it's the most important new fleet um, for establishing, for keeping the class going because you have all fiberglass boats uh, and you, and, and so maintenance is much less of a challenge. Now, the way that you do it is, uh, I think you call it valet sailing to an extent. Uh, it, it's, uh, you buy a share instead of a boat, many of you know this, uh, and you sail a different boat every time you go out racing. And a fleet manager helps to take care of the fleet, and as a result, you get more time you spend a little more money, but you get more time sailing, less time maintaining your boat. And in a minute, I'll be showing some examples of what some other IOD sailors are spending their time on. But what I love is going out here in the Northeaster and being in a super strong boat that I, I know is going to hold together. Uh, these photos are by Nick Schoeder, by the way, who also took the photos in, um, from North, most of the photos from Northeast Harbor. Uh, you built the fleet up to 15 boats. You hosted the Worlds, which I believe this photo was taken at in 2015. And two of your home sailors, Bobby Constable and Peter, finished uh, in the top eight. So good job. It's really been a fantastic addition to the class to have uh, Nantucket sailing IODs. This is a photo that... Uh, uh, Roy might have sent me uh, from the early days. First, one of the first trips to San Francisco that uh, that a couple teams from here made, uh, and you you all recognize more people than I. But Whitey Willauer is the second from the left in the second row, and he's he was one of the original instigators with Peter, and then Colin and Roy in the front row. How many? When was this, Roy? Oh, and there's Linda. It wasn't that long ago. Okay. 
So uh, that, like I was saying before, that one of the cool things about the class is that you do get to travel and you get to sail. Sometimes you combine with different people that you sail against during the during your regular racing because you somebody can't go, so you grab somebody from another boat and. You just develop stronger friendships that way. Another photo uh, uh, with, uh, that Whitey's in and uh, Ian McNeese, who is a uh, recent fleet captain as well, a successful sailor. Um, who are the other two people in the photo? I don't have them identified. Leslie Johnson? OK. A crew, OK, great. And here's a pic photo of Peter and his crew um, at Fisher's Island a few years back. Uh, probably worth saying one more time. We wouldn't be here tonight if uh, Peter wasn't, hadn't instigated this whole thing and been a steady counselor, besides being the fleet captain for, what, the first 10 years. Uh, <clears throat> the fleet does have some openings, and uh, if any of you know some young or young at heart sailors that want to get out there. Uh, well, there's about seven, I, at least seven current IOD sailors in the audience, so just turn to them and have a conversation, or up on the roof afterwards. Now, this is what you don't do at Nantucket. This is uh, an example of a boat built in the 30s or the 40s or the 50s that just needed to be taken apart and put back together again. This is Rick Thompson's boat. I'm going to show you some photos from the Chester fleet in a few minutes, but um, this is a boat called Mighty Mo, which is a f uh, famous boat that was in Scotland and is now in Chester. This is uh, Greg Mancusi and Garo's boat up in Marblehead um, being put back together. Sometimes it's just easier to take the whole deck off and uh, you certainly need to invest in wood clamps. Uh, this is the inside of Norwegian wood in 2011. I'm just going to give you a fast forward through dealing with a lot of delaminated or detaching frames. And this is what it looks like on the outside of the boat at the end of the season when the you just don't have the structure to hold the planks together. And that, that the glue that Bjarneos in our case, put in, in between the planks in the 50s is long gone. So the, the way the boat sails is it swells up when you put it in the water in the spring, and if everything matches up, it stops leaking after a day or two. But then you go out, you crank on the backstay, you crank on the main sheet and all the other sails, and, uh, and you go out on a day that's too windy, and um, little by little, the boat just can't take it. So we... Uh, Charlie Van Voorhis and Jester and, and us in uh, Norwegian Wood sailed to Newport on a day we, in October we probably shouldn't have. Uh, it was blowing about 35, but it was straight downwind. It'll be no problem, right? We just had to jibe once at Point Judith, and we, made, we did make it. But here's what uh, the inside of the boat, our boat, looked like about uh, four months later. Jim Thompson, uh, who's a sailor in our fleet and also a shipwright in Newport, steam bent all these frames um, and it looks like the, oh they lay in there really easily right well here he is pounding with a mallet to get him to bend down to go down into the into the bilge so he can get them attached there uh, and then this is high-tech boat building right you just put in a lot of wedges and and let it so let it cool down there then you put uh, fasteners through the hull in setting the, the uh, fasteners, and then you put wooden bungs over them, and you glue the bungs in. There's our friend Greg, who's knocking off the tops of the bungs. And then we splined every seam, which is like a, a uh, Jim Thompson took a, a circular saw with two blades in it and ran down every seam, half the depth of the plank, and then dry fit these cedar battens and then epoxied them in and shaved them down and so that they, it looked like that. And um, the boat went back in the water and it doesn't leak much. <laughs> uh, and 
here it is in West Harbor on Fisher's Island. Not every rehab project makes it back into the water, though. <laughs> this is the Booth Bay Boat Bar. So if you're in Booth Bay, stop in and see it. So many of our wood boats have found new homes. I mean, we have, I think where it's windy, Bermuda. Well, there's still some wood boats in San Francisco, but um, many of the windier venues have mostly fiberglass boats. And Nantucket's a, a good example. Uh, in, but in some places like Northeast Harbor, they still, there's an affinity for, for wood. And Chester, Nova Scotia is another example. And Rick Thompson, who's a Bermudan sailor, uh, who had the summer home in Chester, decided to take one boat up there and start a fleet there. And they've dragged a whole bunch of boats up there, and they have more than 10 boats now including this is Mighty Mo, that first some assembly required photo that I showed you uh, sailing up there. And my only complaint with Rick is that uh, he didn't put it, well, I, I'm not the only one, didn't put enough non-skid on the foredeck. And when we sailed his boat in the North Americans, which was this regatta uh, here in about five years ago, our bowman parted company with the boat and uh, fortunately, we got him back pretty quickly, and we had to sail off to one side of the course that we were competing against Bobby Constable from Nant Nantucket for that championship, and we, got, we, we went what we thought was the wrong way to pick up my, our bowman, jive back, and, um, and gained on everybody. So maybe it's all part of Rick's plan, but um, anyway, Chester is an exciting new fleet. That's, uh, that's been put together. They're hosting the North Americans again this year um, at the very end of August. And uh, we have a brand new fleet in this place, which is an out-of-the-way harbor with um, massive wind shifts, turbulent tides, ferry boats, tugs, never a dull moment. It's, it's perfect for New Yorkers. Uh, the Manhattan Yacht Club has started a fleet, and they have seven boats. And um, all I can think is, what would a New York stockbroker, Corny Shields, think looking out his window and seeing that fleet out there now? Would he be, he'd be shocked if he were you know, around to, to take in that view. <clears throat> um, and Tom just told me that the Long Island Sound fleet is now, has uh, combined forces with Manhattan, inviting the Manhattan fleet out to Larchmont Race Week, and they had their biggest race week in decades. So uh, hopefully they can uh, spur each other on. I'm sure there's going to be some rivalry. This is the last family scrapbook photo. Uh, Labor Day weekend a couple years ago, Rachel, Isabel, Olivia, Sophie. Uh, we never miss the round Fishers Island race if we, if we can possibly help it. Uh, I want to thank Nick Schoeder, the Rosenfeld Collection, Neil Rabinowitz, um, and many other photographers who contributed to this show. Uh, without them, uh, we would have been done a long time ago, I suppose. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but, and also to Corny Shields for catching sight of this boat, which is now in uh, Washington State, Bainbridge Island. Uh, it's moored out there and does actually com compete in, this, in the classic version of the six-meter fleet uh, that, uh, when they have races out there. So thanks for the creative decision, bold creative decision by Corny Shields to start this class. And thanks for your attention. Does anyone have any questions or want to correct me on anything? We've got a microphone. We can also just go to the rooftop. John. When all is said and done, can the, can the well-restored wooden boat be added? Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Farrar has won two of the last three world championships, has a fiberglass boat in our fleet, and... Um, he is quite sure that 
there are at least two or three wooden boats that are faster than him, uh, including ours. <laughs> uh, it, it appears in lighter air, so the wood boats can be faster if they're really well maintained and they're, uh, you know, the keel and the rudder are in good shape. Uh, in a breeze, the glass boats, I think the glass boats have a little advantage because they're stiffer. But the, when they built the glass boats, they intentionally kept the weights heavy, heavier than you needed to for a fiberglass boat. Uh, so that they could compete, compete during that, what they thought was probably a transition time. The transition still going on. Other questions? Okay. Okay. Thanks, John. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. Yeah. Greatly appreciate it.